broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Depending on where you're logging in from, uh, I, I think I've got you covered. Welcome everyone, another Wednesday, another best practices webinar from Seven Signal. We've got a, a great topic for you today around um, oops, around power saving modes uh, in Wi-Fi and their impact on traffic flow. Uh, Dave Hallis is with me. He hasn't been with us. Uh, well, it's probably been how long, Dave? Maybe a month and a half since you were with us last? I believe so, somewhere on there. All right. So it's good to have you back. We've got uh, Kelsey with us again. She's going to help us with winners here in a little bit. And, and while I'm talking, I'd love to uh, to hear from you all. Let me know where you're logging in from today, whether you're working remotely or at the office. Would be awesome. Just use the Q&A or questions pane in this uh, go to webinar event, and you can let me know. That'd be that'd be great. Um, I am here at uh, the office in Cleveland. Um, Dave Hallis is working remotely. Uh, and Dave, what uh, what's your hometown? Are you? I'm in beautiful Brimfield, Ohio, which is also uh, Kent, Ohio. Oh, that's right. Yep. I don't know why I can never get that into my memory bank. I apologize. Yeah, if you know where Kent State is, I'm just uh, down the road from it. Uh, right on. And then uh, Kelsey is working from her home office, and she's just in downtown Cleveland about uh, 20 minutes from our office here in Independence, Ohio. Got a couple folks logging in here now. Um, I'd love to hear where you're all logging in from and whether you uh, whether you're working from home or remotely. Um, Cheryl is letting me know that uh, um, Cheryl's logging in from Pittsburgh and uh, at home. Uh, and I don't know if Cheryl is short for Shirley or um, let me know that too. Um, don't certainly don't want to get that messed up, but welcome Cheryl. Uh, we've got some folks logged in from the UK. We got uh, Colin. Thanks for letting me know working from home. Uh, I do see a, a couple of folks from the UK from our team over at Open Reality. We've got a, a great partner there in the UK helping us with our distribution. Uh, for those of you logging in uh, from the, from uh, overseas, certainly look them up. Open Reality is a, a good partner to have. We've got uh, Paul back from Southeastern PA. Um, Yes, Cheryl uh, says, uh, yes, that is short for Shirley, but it doesn't like uh, Shirley. I get it, um, but it is a nice name. Uh, another, uh, David, also in the uh, in the UK logging in, working from home is Simon in Nashville. Welcome, Simon. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks, folks, for letting me know where you're, where you're dialing in from. Always love hearing from the audience and, and uh, seeing folks and how far away they are. We get uh, folks from all over the world, and I love seeing how dedicated they are when it's eight, nine, ten o'clock at night their time, and they're still uh, they're still joining us on these webinars. It's great to see. So, um, like I said a little bit earlier, we've got a great show ahead of you uh, today. Um, we're going to talk through uh, Wi-Fi power saving modes and the impact on traffic flow. My name is Don Cook. I'm the head of marketing and channels here at Seven Signal, and with me today is Dave Hallis. Um, he's going to give you a little background on himself here in just a few minutes. Um, it, it's probably been a month and a half since he's uh, joined us on these weekly webinars. So uh, we'll give you some background on him and he get, he puts on a, a great presentation. So a couple of uh, housekeeping notes to go through. As always, our webinars are certified by CWNP. So you can get any CE, any CE credits through us. So you get uh, one credit per webinar uh, that you join for us um, with us. And uh, we don't go into any product tours or uh, talk too much about uh, the product at all during these presentations. So if you are interested in seeing a product um, and getting a demo, you can have a uh, very uh, easy demo, straightforward demo. Every Friday, we have a product tour. There's no sales reps involved. Simply go to go.7signal.com forward slash tour, and we'll drop that link uh, in the chat here in just a few minutes. Um, but you can go there and, and get a Mobileye and Sapphire Eye product tour. All of our uh, webinars are archived on YouTube. So we post them about an hour after um, we finish the webinars here. So you can get access to the webinars uh, there. Uh, we do share the slides on Twitter. 
So, um, and we give out uh, prizes to followers each week. And we're going to hear from Kelsey in here in just a few minutes. Um, but you can get the slides by emailing us directly as well. I'm happy to share those if you are not a Twitter user. I completely understand that. So, without further ado, Kelsey, uh, who were our winners last week? Yeah, Don. So our lucky winners from last week, and I apologize in advance if I mispronounce anyone's name here, but uh, from Twitter, we had Hector Rios and Gustavo Mora. And our trivia winners from last week were George Kaler, Peter Baucus, and Michael Heflin. So congratulations to all of you guys. You should be receiving some Seven Signal merch in the mail soon. Um, as Don said, we post our slides after every single webinar. So go ahead and give us a follow on Twitter. And we look forward to announcing some more winners next week. Yeah, thank you, Kelsey. And she's burning through my uh, my merch uh, budget here. So take advantage <laughs> while we still have it. I think what are we, what are we sending out now, Kelsey? We've got hats going out. Uh, yeah, we got our next, uh, couple weeks anyway, right? That's right. That's correct. All right, right on. All right, moving right along here. A little bit about us. Uh, Seven Signal uh, as a company has been around since 2007. A lot has, has evolved with our products and services over that time. We've hit a lot of major milestones. We're monitoring over a billion data points on a daily basis. We're on over 5 million devices. We've got over uh, 14 patents, over 200 customers. We're GDPR compliant, certified in 40 countries around the world, and we are growing. Um, thanks to all of you. Um, and why we're here, um, we're here because the digital experience matters to your end users. No one has created that perfect access point, that perfect infrastructure, that perfect device that is giving your end users that perfect digital experience. So we've created a completely outside in enterprise framework that gives you full visibility into the end user experience, all AP and device agnostic. And what we have is uh, what we consider an outside in approach, and I'll get to that in a few minutes. But what we're looking for are what we call the top seven Wi Fi problems congestion coverage, co channel and radio interference, and more. Uh, all of these issues, all, all of the issues with Wi Fi, whether they present themselves, uh, themselves as slow or uh, no connectivity to the end user everything bubbles up to one of these seven problems. And we're finding them because we're running active and passive tests on the network and on the devices for things like packet loss, latency and jitter, a MOS score, throughput. Uh, we're looking at adapters and drivers on the devices, looking at the spectrum analysis and packet capture, um, all great tools to help you get right to the root cause of those issues. So you know whether or not the issues are wired, wireless or device related. Um, so if you're looking at a, a standard LAN, um, what you'll what customers have before they come to us is uh, typical infrastructure vendor tools. And there's great information that they're pulling from Riverbed, their AP um, providers like Cisco and Aruba and Extreme, uh, NANSA, uh, AppNeta, SolarWinds, others. Um, these are folks that all look at the infrastructure. Uh, which is not what Seven Signal does. We don't live in the infrastructure. We live on the edge. Um, we're monitoring the devices uh, from a mobilized standpoint. We're installed with an agent on the device looking for uh, issues with the end user experience, where it matters most. Uh, and we also have our Sapphire Eye product, which is a perfect client or sensor that lives up in the rafters with the access points that's monitoring service level quality uh, and RF. Um, so completely different approach um, from what you're looking at now with your infrastructure tools. It's a great complement uh, and something that's that's desperately needed as um, the environments have changed, right? Uh, as evidence today, when I was talking about who's logging in from home uh, and who's working uh, in the office, most of us these days are not uh, enjoying the beautiful networks that uh, our, our network engineers have created for us. We're working from ho our home environments. We're working from uh, uh, whether it's a single home or a multi-tenant or an apartment complex. Those environments are crazy. Uh, and there's no tool out there like Seven Signal that gives you visibility into those external networks. And we've seen significant growth over the last two quarters. Um, due to the to the change in everyone's work environment. So uh, Mobilize is a great tool for that. 
So um, with that said, we do have a great uh, free trial for everyone. Uh, you can go to go.7signal.com forward slash 50 for 50 to get access to our free trial. It's very simple. You're up and running uh, in uh, just two or three days. Um, 50 Up to 50 devices for 50 days is a nice trial. And you get access to our engineers like Dave um, that are going to give you a diagnosis on what's going on uh, with those home environments and how you can remedy those quickly. So um, before I hand the controls over to Dave, we've got one trivia question. Uh, our audience was doing uh, much better last week. Uh, we started out kind of tough the first two weeks. Uh, not a lot of correct answers in here. So uh, Dave, what would you say? Is this a, a hard question we're giving them today? A medium, easy? I'd say hard. Is it hard? Okay, so we'll see how everybody does. Uh, I'll read this to everybody. We'll give everyone enough time to answer. And then we go back at the end of the at the end of the webinar and look to see who answered it correctly first. And I think, uh, Kelsey, if I'm not mistaken, we look at the first three folks. Is that right? That's correct. All right. So let me launch this poll. In the IEEE 80211 1999 standard, what is the maximum number of clients that an AP can have? So good luck, everybody. And I see the numbers rolling in. Um, uh, once they start to settle down here, I'll close out the poll. Please take a moment to answer. All right. All right, looks like they've settled down a little bit here. Let me close out the poll and share the results. And then maybe Dave can let us know how everybody did. Looks like the biggest number is the winner. Yeah, all right, 2007. Uh, 44%, well done. So we will go back and um, figure out who the first three to respond correctly were. Congratulations to all of you. And if you, by chance, happen to respond to that incorrectly, uh, Dave is gonna uh, give you all the background information you need on, on how, to, how to understand this, uh, this subject matter more. So uh, Dave, I'm gonna hand you the controls here if I can find the right buttons. I'm getting closer. You've been good at pushing buttons, John. I'm aware. <laughs> <laughs> I put yeah, I pushed the right buttons. Uh, so while Dave is pulling up slides, if if you haven't already, um, again, we love hearing from all of you and uh, hearing where you're dialing in from and and letting us know if you're working from home or remotely. Um, go ahead and use the Q and A panel for that. And Kelsey is going to monitor the uh, questions today and and work with the Q&A at the end. So we're excited to, to work through those questions as well. Dave, the floor is yours. Tell us a little bit about yourself for those of you, so for those of us who haven't met you. Sure, sure. Hey, so before I get started, just a quick check. Are you able to see my screen okay? It should say something about it. Okay. Cool. Yep. Uh, so things about me. I'm a, a solutions engineer here at 7Signal, uh, CWNA certified. And I've got over 25 years of experience in wireless and product development and also solutions engineering. Uh, I, I used to be at Cisco and I was recognized as a Cisco innovator, mostly al along the lines of uh, security work that I was doing. Uh, as far as standards work, uh, I was uh, the task group chair of 802.11i, which was an enhanced security. So most people kind of familiar with the WPA, WPA2. Uh, that's where uh, it comes from is 802.11i. It's such a long time ago that we now had WPA3. I also more recently was a test group chair, the initial test group chair of 82.11H. This is for sub one gigahertz operation. Uh, and some of that is gonna be related to some of the uh, discussion that we'll have today. Uh, I was also involved in the uh, formation of the Wi-Fi Alliance way back then, it was called uh, Weka. And then I got a number of patents. Um, I put down 13, I don't got more than that, but I figured the last time I looked, uh, it was something like along the lines of 13. So that's enough about me. Uh, so I figured I'd get into the um, topic that we have today, and which is basically uh, power savings. Uh, power savings does affect the way that the, um, the traffic flows, and it, it, there are some implications about uh, how that, that, uh, that your wireless network Forms, and we'll discuss not just the how the power save clients uh, respond, but also other devices. I would say, hey, you know, I had nothing to do with this power save. What's going on? Well, something's a little bit different. 
So we'll talk about, you know, why be concerned about that. Uh, and then also kind of go through the different um, steps. You know, it's, things, uh, as you know, everybody knows with Wi-Fi, that things change over time. Uh, for instance, there's the um, direct sequence initially and frequency hopping, and that's moved on to OFDM and OFDMA, all, we're all, all the way up to 802.11ax. Power saving is the same thing, and that we'll see that that it kind of changes over time with the uh, the different amendments that come come in. Uh, so why do you care about this? Uh, well, obviously most people know that, that why they care about this because you you got your laptop or your phone, uh, it's running off a of battery, and if we don't do a good job of this, that you just end up seeing your battery uh, deplete very quickly. Uh, so there are some things that you kind of go off and do to say, well, let's see if we could do something to save power, make it so that that battery lasts a little bit longer. So that's why you care about this. Uh, so now I kind of said that the power saving it did kind of change over time. Uh, so now you have to kind of put yourself way back to 1999 when the standard was initially coming out. Well, what, what kind of products were out there? Uh, and um, at the time, the big thing was these vertical markets with these uh, hand-held uh, uh, barcode scanners, uh, and then also that it was looking to kind of come out to more of a horizontal market kind of. So we're trying to get into the laptops. Uh, so if people know what the device on the right is, it's like a PCMCA card uh, that you know you used to put it into your laptop. Now that all your laptops standard. Uh, way back then, we kind of like you know dream of oh, actually it's actually embedded in all these laptops. Um, but way back then, it was primarily these handheld barcode scanners, and then let's say, hey, if we gotta get into these laptops, that would be great. And so, therefore, that's how that the initial power saving was kind of taken into account: is how do we come up with some power saving protocols that would apply to these types of devices, these different use cases. Um, and so, what the initial standard has, and well, I'll kind of show a little bit more graphic of this, is that the the client. Uh, for instance, your laptop or so forth, it's going to indicate that it wants to be in power save mode. Uh, there's a power management back, um, bit inside of the um, Mac header. Uh, and then the AP uh, is going to, people are uh, typically familiar with that, uh, beacons get sent out typically like uh, every tenth of a second, so 10 times a second that it's going to send out a beacon. And that the beacon is going to transmit something called the TIM, the traffic indication map. Uh, now there's, there's some changes, I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but just to say that there is uh, a traffic indication map. So what does that mean? So in the beacon, there's a map, there's a bit for each client and that says, oh, there's some traffic for you. So you would want to kind of go off and get it. Uh, and then the client goes, it, you know, if it sees, oh, that there's some traffic for it, it's going to go off and poll and say, oh, let me go ahead and have that. Uh, and then also that there's some broadcast traffic that kind of gets sent out, that's going to be sent out at the D10. So a little bit of trivia we talked about. The reason why that the, the trivia question came out as far as how many clients is that uh, that 2007, where that number comes from is that there's something called an association ID. That number obviously kind of goes up to that 2007 with the base standard. And that, uh, that the traffic indication map has got, it's basically 251 bytes long. Uh, so, so therefore, 251 times 8, you come up with the 2008, which is 2007 plus 1. So that's where that trivia kind of comes from. Uh, so trying to describe, you know, exactly how does this go, I, I was kind of, uh, what you end up seeing is that uh, from the uh, upper left, I'm showing the beacon interval. So that's typically 100 milliseconds. And that, as kind of mentioned, that there's if there's some traffic for clients and the clients kind of sleep, it, it knows that it's got to wake up for these beacons and say, hey, is there anything traffic that I need to go off and get? And then if there is, and the bottom line, it says, oh, I'm going to do a poll. I'm going to ask for that packet. And then it, when after that, it asks for the traffic, it's going to deliver the packet, uh, uh, the access point. It's going to go off and send it. Another key thing that we're kind of showing there is that uh, there's a DTIM. What does that DTIM mean? That DTIM means it's a, usually a multiple of uh, the beacon period. So you could say oh, it could be either every beacon period or it could be a multiple that you go off and send out the uh, broadcast traffic. Uh, and so therefore here we're kind of set it up into, I believe it's four. Uh, so every fourth uh, beacon, we're going to go off and send the broadcast traffic out. 
Uh, so that um, that's kind of important there too. As you can kind of see that this is kind of very, it's useful for these handheld scanners. Uh, and that's, uh, it's kind of very overhead intensive in that you kind of, the device has to wake up, figure out that there's some traffic for it. And then if there is, oh, I got to go grab it. Uh, then as far as laptops, you know, how does that work? Um, usually what laptops would, you know, did at that initial standard was, is that, as I kind of mentioned, there's just a bit that indicates that you're in power save mode. So all that the laptops would need to do was, was is just switch and say, I'm in power save. Oh, there's some traffic for me. So therefore I need to, I'll switch out of power save so that the access point will start delivering it to me. And so that you end up seeing like a flurry of activity. Uh, and then sometime later, the device figures out, hey, I, you know, I don't see any more traffic. If I don't see any traffic, for instance, after a second or something like that, I'll go back to sleep and wait till there's more traffic for me. And that's what this, uh, this slide is trying to represent here. Uh, so the key thing there, though, is that kind of keep in mind uh, that the presence of one device that's in power save mode is going to uh, affect the way that other devices that are not in power save uh, are going to behave. That the response uh, where I'm trying to show here is, um, if you're familiar with the say, for instance, like I'm going to ping, so like two laptops. That's our, which I call active client one and active client two. So if active client one was going to ping the other uh, laptop, uh, what's going to happen if we were to do like a Wireshark sniff of what's going on, you would see an ARP would go out from the first laptop because it's got to figure out uh, the MAC address, layer two address, so that, that uh, that's going to be a broadcast packet. So now you that if the client one sends it to the access point, the access point is not going to send it back out again to uh, the client two because it's a broadcast packet. And therefore, it's going to wait until the DTIM because then all devices that are in power save mode would wake up and they have to kind of look and sit to listen to the, the broadcast traffic. And so, the, uh, so therefore, then that the um, broadcast uh, uh, ARP pack would go ahead and be sent out. Uh, and then that there would be a response to it. So there's this gap in time, which is forced upon the devices that are not even in power save mode. Now, obviously, this is strictly just for broadcast traffic, uh, but it's something to keep in mind. I put a note on there, also a little bit of a tangent, that well, hence this is kind of why proxy ARP is useful uh, for people that are not familiar with what proxy ARP is. Basically, the access point will reply to the ARP if it really knows what the answer is. You don't have to wait. Uh, so that's what I kind of uh, do. So th therefore, you'd get a, an immediate response instead of delaying. But that's just one type of um, broadcast traffic. Uh, there could be other types of um, broadcast tra traffic. For instance, usually if you're thinking about some discovery type of protocol, those are typically initiated by some type of broadcast. And that's what you would end up seeing. So why am I kind of going through this? If you were to see something like you were to do a ping, you were to notice that on the first ping, that that's a large time frame, and then everything else kind of goes quickly. And this is basically what you're running into. It's the same thing with any other of these types of protocols which get initiated by some discovery type of packet that kind of goes out. You'd end up seeing this type of activity. That's why I kind of bring it up. Well, after the initial standard came came out, uh, then obviously people were kind of interested in other things. Well, you know, what about um, what about phones? That we're doing uh, a number of uh, people were kind of com companies were coming out with uh, voice over Wi-Fi, so that was definitely desired. Um, and then also people were kind of looking at video. Hey, you know, can't you run video over these things? Sure, you can. Uh, but that you know that that would typically go. It would work okay if you've got one AP with one um, client, but if you start to add other clients, or you're in a carpeted office, things are going to start to break down. Uh, so therefore, that there was, um, you know, that uh, things didn't work as well, and so things needed to be done uh, and uh, to improve that situation. And so, uh, luckily, that the 802.11e and uh, out of the Wi-Fi alliance, the WMM, came to the rescue with a, um, a standard way to enhance. Uh, the um, uh, the way that uh, the quality of service would go to these phone devices and video devices. Along with that, 
there are certain requirements and we'll kind of get into as far as power saving because power saving all of a sudden didn't quite work for these types of situations. So let me kind of show a little bit of why. Um, well, this is kind of getting into the answer, but the reason why is, is that the power saving was tied to the beacon. The beacon is typically going out at 100 milliseconds. If you look at voice traffic, one thing that's nice about it is that it's predictable with what you should see. Uh, but we're really talking about maybe something that's going out back and forth like every 25 milliseconds. Uh, kind of depends on the type of voice, but it's periodic and it's much less than the beacon. So if you're sitting there waiting for the beacon to try to make things go, your, it, part, that power saving just isn't going to work. So a new power saving mode was needed uh, to support this type of traffic. So there's two things. Uh, one is there's a um, uh, automatic power save delivery protocol that came along with 811E, which was that quality of service enhancements. Uh, one was unscheduled, and that unscheduled is kind of very su well suited, and we'll see that you know why that is uh, to the phone traffic. And then there's scheduled. Scheduled, you kind of like talk about streams of traffic, uh, and therefore the configuration phase. I'm not going to get into too much on the configuration phase because that would uh, take us a long time to discuss, but it, it enough to say that this happens. You could either do it when you initially connect, you know, through the association. There's also um, some action frames, the, the uh, add uh, traffic stream packets. Uh, so if you were actually doing uh, like a packet capture to see a phone call happen, you know, typically what you would end up seeing is, oh, there's these add TS packets. What are those? That's the configuration, kind of like setting up the agreement between the client and the um, of the access point as far as how that the traffic is going to be sent. So what you would end up seeing here is now this is the unscheduled uh, APSD. This is kind of like for voices. I kind of mentioned what you would end up seeing is both that the client and the access point need to send some traffic periodically, like maybe every 25 milliseconds. So here what ends up happening is that the client sends off a trigger frame uh, saying so that you know the, the AP thinks that he's that the client's asleep. The AP gun goes off and say, uh, the client says, "Hey, here's a trigger. I'm, I, I need to uh, exchange some traffic right now, not after the, you know the beacon." Uh, so that the trigger frame could either be uh, a null data packet or some data. You know, we could just trigger the, uh, the exchange with the data packet. So for voice, you know, if you're talking, uh, that data packet kind of goes off, and then likewise that the access point sends a uh, response. Uh, and so therefore that, that could happen uh, between the, diff the different beacons going out. And that's the key thing, is that you're not limited, you're not tied to that beacon timing. Now, the other thing that you might've thought about like with video is that what you'd end up seeing is, you talk about a stream of traffic. And with that stream, there's a lot of traffic. You know, For instance, if you're watching a video on your laptop, what you'd end up seeing is a bunch of traffic kind of going from the access point to the clients. There's and what you'd end up seeing is that here that there's likewise there could be some kind of trigger mechanism, whether that's a schedule or an actual packet. And then after that, you would end up seeing that there are some uh, a stream of packets that kind of end up being delivered to the client. So that's what the Airtel 11 um, E kind of brought in. <laughs> we knew that we knew that was going to happen, Dave. <laughs> I, I could have put money on <laughs> that that ring that you all heard in the background is Dave's wine delivery. <laughs> UPS. <laughs> it's, it's Cabernet and Merlot, and I'm sorry, Mr. UPS. <laughs> Funny. <laughs> so then, along with 82.11n, new technology comes along. With that new technology. There's kind of like another take a look at, well, how does it go as far as uh, the type of uh, traffic and what we could do as far as power saving? Uh, the one thing I kind of mentioned at first was there's this power save multipole. It's kind of like an enhancement upon the uh, APSD uh, in, in which that, you know, you still have a trigger finger that kind of goes off. There's some scheduling uh, of clients uh, traffic. Uh, so therefore, it's just kind of like to optimize things. Uh, then the other thing to kind of discuss, which just kind of makes a lot more sense as far as the new technology, is the spatial multiplexing power save. So with 11N, the, the key thing that we know is that there's multiple streams that kind of, kind of are going on. For instance, multiple radios. On, like on a client, on a radio itself, there's multiple radios. 
Uh, so, you know, if we say two by three or three by three, well, what if I, you wanted uh, to, one way of saving power is to say, instead of having three receive streams, I just want one. So therefore, because I'm in power save, that's a way to kind of do it. And you could, this could either be static or dynamic. And the dynamic way of kind of switching back and forth is to use an RTS CTS scheme, kind of right upon that to all of a sudden, okay, the access point send you this um, RTS the CTS exchange, and you then inform that the client that hey, that I'm now, um, it, you know, I've now got my additional um, radio streams up and running, so I can kind of operate. There goes my wine, by the way. It's going away. <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> uh, so then also the thing that kind of goes on is that 11AX is now kind of coming along. Uh, and what you end up seeing is that you might have heard some things about target wake times. Uh, and what that does is uh, that you might not have kind of realized, I didn't really highlight it, uh, but that's when I kind of mentioned that the polling of the, uh, the access point, for instance, the beacon kind of goes out, there's a TIM, which indicates that there's some traffic. Well, what if you have like five devices that are in power safe? Well, now they're all going to poll at the same time. <laughs> that now obviously that the you know that there's they'll try to uh, like any transmissions, those polls would kind of go out and they should be spaced out. But they're all kind of like right after the beacon. So it's setting up for a bunch of contention and collisions. So that's kind of like a bad way of doing things. And so what the, this kind of does is the target wait time, the, the nice thing that it does is it spreads that out. So if you do have a large number of devices that are in power save mode, you make it spread out. Don't bunch up and try to access uh, the access point, the wireless medium, right at the same time. You're in power save mode, so you're not in a big hurry. Uh, so it's one way of kind of doing things. And also things that kind of, kind of come out are longer sleep times. Um, that's kind of like happened uh, a number of times uh, throughout the um, 8 to 11, whether it's through 11V or 11AX. Uh, and this um, target wait time initially came um, out through the 8 to 11EH, a number of other mechanisms that all of a sudden then kind of trickled through uh, and came up to 8 to 11AX. And they kind of took that same uh, mechanism, maybe improved, tweaked it a little bit, improved it. Uh, and what we really want, you know, that they're, the desire is, is to have a mixture of IoT devices and very fast devices. Uh, so to do that, that'll obviously add some challenges, and it's a way to try to uh, um, mitigate some of the problems that'll pop up. There are some other power saving modes, and you know I'm not going to get into everything. Uh, for people that are uh, the trivia people, <laughs> there's something that's called IBSS. This is kind of like I've got one laptop and another laptop, and I want to have a quick connection. Uh, and so it's never used very much. It was used a little bit uh, when the standard first came out. Uh, and also in PowerSafe, I would say that things definitely seem a bit broken when you try to do PowerSafe in an IBSS. Then also more popular lately is uh, Mesh, and that, uh, that also presents, Mesh presents some additional challenges with PowerSafe, because if you're a Mesh node, you know, if traffic is going to go through you, well, <laughs> you, know, you can't be asleep, right? <laughs> then, otherwise, the traffic's not going to go very fast. So there's something that they talk about being a light sleep mode, and that uh, you'd end up kind of still uh, not only needing to keep track of when the beacon is coming out of like an access point, but it's all your mesh peers that you need to keep track of when their beacons are, so you can kind of keep track of when there's traffic um, destined for yourself. And I believe we're at the end of the slide sets, and I'm at the end of my wine, so that I could have used that delivery. <laughs> We just missed it by a few minutes, Dave. Sorry about oh, that. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, run out there. <laughs> that's what uh, that's actually what Anders suggested you do. Anders, how you doing? Welcome back. Uh, he he said, uh, go get the wine before it's too late. <laughs> We're glad that you didn't, so you could finish your presentation. But I I apologize that uh, we ran through that. Um, so Kelsey's going to uh, address any of the questions that you all have here in just a minute. Let me catch up on. Uh, some of the, the chatter that came through as we were presenting, folks were catching up and letting us know where they're logging in from. And of course, please use this time to, to drop your questions into the, the Q&A pane. But um, Anders obviously joining us, uh, welcome back. Uh, he's in the Swedish mountains, uh, right near the Norwegian border. I'm sure the views are spectacular. Anthony is down in from Australia. Welcome, Anthony. I'm not sure if you're with our in technology team out there, a big distributor that we have in Australia, but uh, welcome. And if you're not working with those folks, 
they're uh, great partners of ours, so please uh, reach out to them. Um, we've got um, uh, Palisade, um, Minnesota. Welcome, Todd. And uh, I don't know if I missed, I don't think I missed anyone there. So, um, Kelsey, let me turn it over to you. Uh, do you see any questions in there uh, for Dave? Uh, I got uh, another one. Abu, sorry, uh, Abu from South Africa. Welcome back, Abu. Perfect. Yeah, Don. So our first question that we actually got in, just to kind of clarify for everyone, um, Jafar asked us if we have the recordings available after the webinar. So just to remind everyone, we do post all of our webinar recordings to our YouTube channel later this afternoon at 7Signal. So you can go and check that out there. So let's see what other questions we have coming in here. We have Bruce asking us, um, do you think a high retry environment can significantly increase battery drain, Dave? Oh, definitely. Uh, you know, that you're going to drain the battery based off of how many transmissions you've got. And as you've got a lot of retries, you know, you're going to drain the battery. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Um, you guys can keep putting your questions in the question and answer panel here. We have a lot of comments um, apologizing for the wine incident, Dave. So again, sorry about that for you. It's very unfortunate. No one is sorrier than Dave. <laughs> <laughs> What am I going to do tonight? Yeah. yeah. We had Anders say. Well, it looks like. Have... Uh... Oh, sorry, Don. Uh, we just had Anders say sorry. that you should have a TDT targeted delivery time for your wine. So maybe keep that in mind for next time. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> Okay, let's see here. Um, our other question from Dave um, to Dave is, in fast roaming locations, is it not better to run with power save off, such as in warehouses? Well, if you're looking at performance, uh, definitely that's, um, you know, it, it all kind of depends on your perspective of what does best mean. That uh, if you're looking to say, well, I'm really interested in roaming quickly, yeah, <laughs> run to power save off. And the things all, because if you think about it, what does power save mean? It means that the device itself is going to sleep. And if you're trying to roam quickly and the device is sleeping, you know, it's it's going to take a while. It's kind of like, you know, I don't get much done when I'm sleeping too. <laughs> so, <laughs> like after I had the wine. <laughs> so so if you're if you're interested in, in a fast roam, yes, you could increase it by getting rid of power save. But the downside is you, know, you got to balance things. Uh, that you, you'd say, well, if I've got a phone, which has got a, maybe a smaller battery, uh, and I'm looking, or these handheld devices too, that they're really kind of looking to um, uh, say that they want battery savings as well uh, as, uh, as fast roaming. That, um, you know, keep in mind that uh, the beacon period is 100 milliseconds. So it kind of depends on if you have a phone call going, are you going to notice 100 milliseconds? Yes, you will. Uh, if you've got one of these handheld um, barcode scanners and it took you 100 milliseconds uh, longer, are you going to notice that? No, you're not going to notice that. Uh, so it really depends on your application and what you're interested in is. And then the, what best means is you have to kind of balance uh, that power saving and your performance. Awesome. Thank you, Dave. We have one last question here from Anders, and he commented and said, I keep remembering something related to IPv6 and PowerSave because every brost, brost is multicast in the world of IPv6. Any tweaks there to be made? Yes. Yeah. So that that's you know a good point there is that that's kind of where I was kind of going with the issue of that uh, seeing the broadcast kind of going out there. You can um there's kind of something called reliable um, um multicast uh, and so therefore th th that does a uh, number of things that came out through 8 to 11 aa i don't remember any sort of the um uh, power saving uh, in uh, issues kind of going along with it one of the options is that you could kind of change the broadcast to a specific client into a, a uh, directed packet and obviously that that would make it so that that would work out well now obviously if you get I'll go way too much into the into There's like these three options. Uh, and one way is to make it a, a directed packet. You could also kind of like uh, uh, use um, 
some of the aggregated packets. And I believe that the way that that works is that anything that was not received, they can uh, be sent back. So the, the uh, overall guidance there is to maybe take a look at 80 to 11A so that you're tr making that tra traffic going from a broadcast traffic to a delivery packet. And then how do you do that so that you don't make it so that you're exploding the amount of traffic? And the, the way that I'd guide there is to take a look at is 80 to 11A, do you have some options there as far as some support for that, uh, that those protocols? All right, awesome. So I don't see any other questions in the panel in case I missed one, Kelsey, am I wrong about that? I think that was it. All right, well, everyone, thanks for joining us today. Dave, awesome job as usual. Welcome back. It's been a, it's been too long since you joined us out here. So uh, great to have you back. Everybody, we'll see you all next week. Uh, we'll have another awesome topic for you. The invites will go out on Monday. We'll see you next Wednesday. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>